All right, we've been in the Gospel of John. We'll be in the Gospel of John a little while. I want to make sure you hear. Uh, next Sunday, uh, we, will, we will have a very strange sermon. Get ready for strange things. So if you're like, I don't like it whenever he, he preaches and talks a lot. Remember that time where he went up and down the aisle with the sleeping bags? It's going to be sort of like that. Be ready. Um, also next Sunday, because it connects with the message of the sermon, we will observe the Lord's Supper. Um, but where have we been at in the Gospel of John before we read God's Word? Last week we ended. Was Jesus, at the end of chapter 6, very successful, or was he a loser? He's a loser. He's, he's, he barely has, he barely has a, 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 any, any followers to his name. They have abandoned him for his hard teaching. And today's passage, uh, we're, we're on this journey to Jerusalem with Jesus and uh, John 7, go ahead and be open in your Bible there. Here's what you're going to look for, because it's a lot of words. I know you may get lost, um, but here's what you're going to look for as we are reading it. You're going to be listening for the different characters in the passage. There are many different characters. They're not all the same. Some of them sound similar. And I'll give you a hint. I've got most of them underlined just to help you out. But John 7, please stand for the reading of God's word. Please stand if you're able. We're going to read all 31 verses and your job is to listen for the characters john 7 1 after this jesus went about in galilee he would not go about in judea because the jews were seeking to kill him now the jews feast of booths was at hand so his brother said to him leave here and go to judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly if you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. Verse 10, But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private, the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. Verse 14. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. He has not, Moses, given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Verse 20, the crowd answered, You have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath the man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. Verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet, what? Come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Before we get into the, this next part, I want us to hear, here's, here's your point of the sermon. For you today, to rightly judge who Jesus is. Or let me phrase it this way. The most important question you will answer today 
is who is Jesus? We're going to see there's a lot of characters in today's story. They're making lots of judgment calls about who Jesus is. Is he a, is he a good guy? Is he a prophet? Is he a, is he a bad guy? Is he leading people astray? But that question, who is Jesus, is of eternal importance. And it demands your attention right now. So many people in our culture, so many people who even say they're believers, say, I'll put that off. I won't think about that today. But it is the most important question every day. Well, let's go ahead and look at this uh, uh, next slide. Let's talk about the characters. Make sure we understand them. Because here's, here's the temptation in this passage. We read this long list of scenes that there's several days that go by. There's a long journey that goes on. And we blend all the people together. We're like, well, there's Jesus. We know he's important. Nod your head, yes, if Jesus is usually important. Yes, yes. And then, and then we see all this other stuff, and it's like Galilee, crowd, the Jews, the, the Jerusalem. And we just mush them all together. We make it Jesus versus all those guys. We need to understand they have different motivations, different questions about who Jesus is. So, so Jesus, what we see in this passage, what he says about himself is that the, the world hates me. And my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. That's in verse 6 and 7. Jesus, ident- if, if, people, if people in our world say Jesus didn't think he was special, he didn't think he was the son of God, I would look at verse 6 and 7 and say, uh-uh. He knows he is completely unique and different. And who is he saying this to? Is he saying that to the Pharisees in verse 6 and 7? He's saying it to his brothers. His brothers, his brothers who do not believe, which if we know from John 20, we know, ding, 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 that's bad news. But they don't believe, but they sort of want to encourage Jesus. They want to encourage Jesus to come down publicly. Here's the deal. Jesus' driver's license, where where it says he lived and worked and spent his days, did it say Bethlehem or does it say Nazareth? Nazareth, Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. We know he was born in Bethlehem. But in terms of the conception of the world. So Jesus' brothers, and even he himself, would, rec- would, would represent the, these Galilean Jews. And we'll see in this story, these Galilean Jews are thought of as different. Here's the, here's the basic gist of it. If, if you wanted to get a group of Jewish people riled up to start a revolution to overthrow the, the Persians or the Romans or the Greeks, a good place to start was in the Galilee. It was in the Galilee. We'll, we'll talk more about why, but there had been uh, several revolutions that had begun sort of on a peasant level where Galileans marched down from the north towards Jerusalem or wherever the bad guys are, whether it be uh, one of the Caesareas or whatever the capital is, and they're like, we're going to throw you out. God said so. So Jesus' brothers are representing this Galilean mindset of Jesus. You could be a big shot. We don't believe you're the son of God. That's crazy, but, but you, it could really work this time. Reveal yourself publicly. And we'll talk more about Jesus' response to them. So there's the Galilean Jews. Another question. In, in Galilee, Jesus has been famous, and then he said, eat, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and he got less famous, right? If you hear a teacher stand up and say, eat my flesh and drink my blood, it's okay if you think that's weird. But, but before that saying, has Jesus been fairly popular in the Galilee? Yes, he's done healings. He, he's had people say, we don't know who he is or where he's from, but most people view him favorably, if not are willing to follow him. We even have synagogue leaders in the Galilee that are like, this Jesus guy is a good guy, which is going to be a different attitude from a word that, Paul, or that John uses to describe this next kind of character, the Judaioi. So this is in your Bible in English, it says the Jews, but I, I put the Greek word there, not because it's magic, but because it helps us remember, this isn't talking about what we think of as, as the, the whole Jewish uh, nation or the, every descendant of Abraham, these are the ones with power. These are the ones who represent uh, more of the, the traditions of it. They, they even talk about how there are these uneducated people and there's these educated ones. And so th- this really could have been anybody near and around the temple, but specifically there's two groups. They're not, they're not completely referenced by name here, but there's the Pharisees, which we won't go into all the ways they're distinct, But these guys, they liked the Messiah. They really liked the Messiah. But what we will learn from John 5 is they liked the Messiah coming as a result of their traditions. 
So that's going to that's gonna come up in today's passage. Um, so they thought the Messiah coming and kicking Rome out was a good idea. But then there's the Sadducees. And, and the, the classic Baptist example is they're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection, which truly is sad. But in a political sense, there, there's another truth to this. On paper, the Sadducees like the Messiah. But most of the high priests, most of the Sanhedrin, most of the people who are the boss of the Jewish religion are from this Sadducee group. And even though on paper they may say, yes, the Messiah is good, at the temple, there's, there's a, 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 a garrison, there's a stationing of Roman guards that their job is to help sort of protect and also control the temple. And we'll see that they also have officers in their name. Here's the truth. The Sadducees may say, we like the Messiah coming. We, we like that idea. But if the Messiah came and truly overthrew everything, truly made the top the bottom, they wouldn't be winners. They would be losers. If, if the Messiah comes and overturns the apple cart, the, these Judea are going to lose. They'll lose their respect. They'll lose their, their Roman support. They'll lose the whole system that they have created to uh, assure their control and power. And so then we have one other group that is referenced in this passage um, uh, towards the end of it, uh, beginning in verse uh, 25. And this is another crowd. It's the same word for crowd, but it specifically says the people of Jerusalem. So these aren't necessarily the Pharisee, Sadducee group. These are just people from Jerusalem in general. We'll talk more about next week what the Feast of Tabernacles is and what happened and what it was like. But we've got all these Galileans, which were viewed essentially as hicks, uh, rebellious, you know, hot-headed hicks, coming down for a party in Jerusalem. And the Jerusalem crowd, they're used to daily getting teaching and instruction around the temple. They say, I'm not of a priestly family, but... I know what's going on here. I've seen it all before. And they view themselves as the in crowd. They expected strange teachings and teachers to come from Galilee. And so we'll see, that's why they have some questions about Jesus. You can see that their thinking in this story has been influenced by the priests, by the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Whereas the Galileans, the only real influence they have is, what has Jesus done that we've seen? We've been around him. Um, But let's see, make sure we see a a big piece of context. You will not understand this story if you don't understand John 5. Let's go to this next slide. Because in this in this passage today, Jesus, out of nowhere, is going to bring up circumcision. Jesus, why would you bring it up that you know they don't like it when you talk about that? It's because last time Jesus was in Jerusalem, he he did he did a big no-no with regards to their traditions. So we have in John 5. One, we have this. Five, one, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So see, same song and dance. But this is his, his first time to meet these guys and, and really display himself publicly. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. And long story short, this is where all the people who need healing hang out. And Jesus meets the guy there. And Jesus tells him this. Jesus said to him, verse 8, Get up, take up your bed, and what? Walk. Uh Uh-oh, on the Sabbath, are you supposed to command people to pick things up and walk? No. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. But then we read later on down, uh, let's see, what verse is that in? Now, a discussion arose between... Oh, I have skipped a page. Sorry about that. Uh, get up and take up your bed and walk. Now, that day was the Sabbath, verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. And long story short, the man says, Hey, I understand that's your tradition, but the guy who healed me said to do it. I'm going to listen to him. And so John tells us this startling news, verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. See, before this moment in in John's gospel, the religious leaders, they have good reasons for not liking Jesus. They don't have good reasons for wanting to kill Jesus, but they're beginning to build their case. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. 
So Jesus, after that story in Jerusalem, goes back to the Galilee, continues doing miracles, continues doing teachings, and, and, and that's all old news. But he knows whenever he comes to Jerusalem, what's the last thing that these Jerusalem crowds and these Jerusalem teachers are going to be thinking about? That's the rabbi. That's the teacher that completely trashed our traditions. We got to do something. We'll see why that's why they are waiting for him and expecting him. Let's make sure we see the, the two verses, the two sections right around us. Let's go to the, the context in John. Just want to make sure we remember. Jesus' brothers are encouraging Jesus to reveal himself publicly because in John 6:66 6, it says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. I said at the beginning of today's sermon, is Jesus coming into this, this visit for tabernacles on a super wave of success or a big rejection failure? Rejection, failure. He is, he is a loser of a rabbi. He only has 12 disciples, and one of them will betray him to his name. Now, there's great promise. Peter has declared, uh, you have the words of eternal life. Those disciples believe pretty greatly. But that sets up the whole attitude and mindset of the brothers. We don't believe in you, but it sure would be nice if you were a little bit more popular. You should go down and make a scene. Let's see what happens. And then after this passage, we're not going to finish the story of Tabernacles today. I want to make sure that you, you see how it all connects, though. We're going to have the Pharisees wanting to arrest Jesus. And then we're going to have Jesus at the high point of the Feast of Tabernacles say these words in verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. We're going to see next week that Jesus believes and understands that he fulfills all of the hopes and promise of tabernacle. So if someone says, ah, oh, Jesus didn't think he was special, he didn't think he was the fulfillment of prophecy, you say, you got to read Jesus' words. He believes, he knows. And then we'll, we'll see this, this last thing. Remember, John is doing this march towards rejection and rejection and rejection. And I point this out with the men's class this morning. Verse uh, 51 of chapter 7, which flows from this. Nicodemus thinks he is helping Jesus. Uh, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing? Nicodemus thinks he's helping. I I'm going to help this Jesus out. Question, will Jesus have a trial publicly before kings and governors before he dies? Yes. John is painting the picture that Jesus' life and his story and his mission is being moved forward, not by the Pharisees, not by the Sadducees, not even by the disciples that thought they were helping or the disciples that thought they were hurting, but by the plan of God. So that's where we'll go next week, but we see that it's all connected, and uh, we're beginning this tabernacle story. Let's go to this slide with scenes on it. So this first part of the passage the first nine verse jesus is not in jerusalem yet he's talking to them about it and so we have the the galilean or the pilgrim crowd mindset explained so that the brothers ask jesus hey verse three leave here and go to judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing bring it out in public try to rally them to your cause make a big go of it and then the whole occasion for it is the Feast of Booze, which we'll talk more about what the traditions and rituals look like next time. But this is, this is a harvest festival, September, October. It was, it was thanking God for the harvest of the last year, and that involves some, some rituals concerning rain and water. But here's the main point. Does Jesus agree with his brothers? Does he say, yes, you're right. I should go raise the army. Revolution happens today. No. Instead, he says this, my time has not yet, what, come, but your time is always here. So they asked him, come down to Jerusalem, make a public display, and Jesus' answer is, my time has not yet come. Does that mean we've caught Jesus in a lie? No. On, on a face value, it sounds like he's rejecting them, but that word, uh, time is not the, the normal word that we see for time. It is the word kairos, which I say not because it's a magic word, but because in the Greek culture, it means an appointed time, a, a planned out time. One definition of it, let me make sure I get it. Let's see what it says. 
uh, the occasion, or, or I, I love this one. It is the time to bring about crisis. Jesus is saying, it isn't time for me to start the crisis. I'm going to do big things. Big things are going to happen, but not the way you're talking about, brothers. If he went to Jerusalem with big pomp like they wanted, uh, the crowd would do one of two things. And we've already seen this in John at the feeding of 5,000. They would either accept him for what he could do for them, and they would try to make him king. Jesus specifically rejects that at the feeding of 5,000. Or the, the crowd in general and all the Jerusalem people would reject him. They would drag him out into the street and kill him. Do they try to do that in this story? Yes, even with Jesus being secretive. But, but if he dies, if he, if he disappears because the powerful people make him disappear, is that how God wants his death to fulfill his promise? No. That's, that's in the way the crisis works out. It doesn't mean he's never going down for tabernacles. It means I'm not doing it the way you said. And we'll talk more. Uh, he does say the very interesting phrase. We'll talk about this then. He reminds them, your time, your kairos, your crisis point is always here. We'll talk about what that means towards the end of Dame's sermon. But there's this, there's this, there's this Galilean crowd mindset of, hey, let's do another revolution. We like those things. Maybe it works this time. Jesus says that's not how the kairos is going to go down. And then John, the, the author, zooms way out, and, and he just gives us a bunch of narration of, of how the feast is going. And this is from the perspective of the Galilean crowd sort of meeting the Jerusalem crowd. So that they've marched down, and after this, this is verse 10, his brothers had gone up to the feast. Then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. And this is John telling us what the scene is like on the ground. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? So that's, that means the, the word for the religious leaders, the ones who are well-connected, the ones in power. Where is he? Last time I was here, he ticked us off. Tell us where he is. And the, the people from Galilee are saying, he is a good man. Others said, no, he's leading people astray. They don't know where he is. If he said, march down with us, we would have been there, but we weren't really sure who he was. We don't know what's going on. What I want us to see in what the Galilean crowd is saying is that they are, are talking about what they saw in Galilee. We saw him heal some people. We, we saw him feed thousands of people. But some of his teaching really confused us. And, and, and some of it was hard. And so maybe he's leading us astray. And we heard last time that he was here, he ticked you guys off. And the Judaioi are asking, where is he? If we remember from John 5, we can expect that they don't have good intentions. But for right now, they're just saying, where is he? Where are you hiding him? Are, are you going to reveal him and start a revolt without telling us about it? We got to know. And then let's, let's go to this next slide. Uh, John is going to give a specific time stamp for these next set of verses. Now we're, we're from the beginning of the feast. It's, it's past the introduction of the Galilean crew and the Judaeal crew. And now we're going to have actual discussion with and about Jesus. So we have that the Jesus is there, uh, not like his brother said. He didn't come marching down with an army, but he's come to the temple. Just like any other rabbi, he comes to the temple and starts teaching. And the, the Judaioi, verse 15, therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? He has never studied. Uh, what, what they're talking about here isn't the study of Scripture. It's not the study of Scripture. I've, I've got this, this quote from a rabbinical saying. It says this, If anyone has learned the Scripture, Moses, Psalms, the prophets, but not the Mishnah, he is an uneducated man. And furthermore, the way they identified someone's authority was on the basis of who their rabbi was. Sort of, what is your, what is your pedagogical lineage? Who was your teacher? Who was their teacher? How much of the Mishnah and Talmud, these traditions on top of traditions, do you know? Because they know Jesus is a poor, uh, a backwater hick from Galilee. We, we've been around the temple all our lives. My father's father was the father of someone's father. Jesus can't point to that. But listen to Jesus' response. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. At this point, they would have been, they would have been leaning forward. 
oh, he's about to tell us who he thinks his rabbi is. I bet it's going to be some, you know, uh, online, pay-for-you-degree university uh, type thing. This, this is going to be good. He says, my teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Who is Jesus saying who his rabbi is, who his teacher is? God. You point to your rabbi, I point to God. Oh, that's a big claim. He is saying, I speak on God's authority, not my own. And uh, then he's going to go on the offensive. This is what he says. Has not Moses given you the law? Let's talk about scripture, not Mishnah. Let's talk about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? He's saying, I can talk to you guys about scripture. We, We can talk about the thing that matters. You're not keeping it. They would have been leaning forward, expecting to make fun of him. Now they're leaning back. They are ticked. And at this point, Jesus says this, Why do you seek to kill me? So he was saying that to the religious leaders. That's why knowing who the, who's speaking is really important uh, in, in, the, in the dialogue. He's saying that to them. Why do you seek to kill me? And then it's really uh, confusing unless we pay attention. In verse 20, the crowd response, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? That's the Galilean crowd. They, they've, had, they've had synagogue rulers uh, sort of like Jesus. They've had religious leaders say, maybe he's good. Uh, they, they, they've seen him be mildly successful. Certainly nobody said, let's kill him. It's just been, ah, we don't know how to feel about him. So this may have been one of the first times those Galileans heard that the Jerusalem, the, the Judaioi crowd, hates Jesus. And they're like, whoa, Jesus, what are you talking about? That's what that you have a demon is. They're not blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. It's like they're saying, you're out of your mind. But when did this happen? Jesus knows it happened in John 5. It happened last time he was here. So Jesus' response is, I did one work before. I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Referring to the work of John 5, I made that man whole. Moses gave you circumcision. And I'll just read this whole passage because it's brilliant how Jesus sets this up. Moses gave you circumcision. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. Uh, Question, this is the only way you understand this. In circumcision, are you adding something to someone's body or taking something away? Okay, just make sure you got that part of it. All right? So circumcision, you can take part of the body away on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken. The law says you can take part of the body away. This is what Jesus says. Are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? You guys mutilate the body on the Sabbath, and it is according to the law. I am making a body whole, and you're saying that that is evil, that that is deserving death. And so Jesus' response is, do not judge by appearances. Look at those high cotton religious leaders or their degrees and papers, and their teachers upon teachers and traditions upon traditions, but judge rightly. I am just laying out scripture plain. And this is, uh, this is important for us to uh, see in how Jesus is refuting them, because you will have sometimes where you'll have even Baptist teachers look at this and they'll say, ah, see, Jesus is saying uh, book learning, studying scripture is, is less important than your intuition. It's not what he's saying here. He's saying, let's talk deeply and precisely about scriptures. I, I have heard of churches and teachers using a passage like this and talk about uh, we, uh, seminary, books, all that. That's, that's not important. We don't need that kind of study. J- just, just read it and declare it. No, study is good. Jesus' precise answer comes from him precisely knowing God's word, not the Mishnah and Talmud. He's not saying don't use your brain. He's saying it, use it rightly. So then what John zooms out again. Uh, we, he doesn't tell us whether anybody believes or understands Jesus. He just sort of really ticks off the religious leaders and is revealed, I know you're trying to kill me because of what I did in John 5. And then he goes and zooms out really big to an overview of the feast. And the beginning part of this story of tabernacles is mainly about what the 
the Galilean crowd was experiencing. What were they learning about this conflict between Jesus and the Judaioi, the religious leaders? But then in verse 25, the, the perspective shifts. It is now from the perspective of the Jerusalemites. It actually says in verse 25, some of the people of what? What does it say in verse 25? Look at your Bible. Someone help me out. Some of the people of Jerusalem. People of the city. They're not traveling for the Feast of Tabernacles. They're already there. If there was Airbnb in that day and age, they could have made some money. Except for everybody's supposed to build their own little house anyways. And, and they have been hearing not about Jesus from his work in the Galilee, but from the rumors and the gossip and the slander of the religious leaders. So that's why they say, here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. They've heard the religious leaders. They're not surprised at all. We've heard these guys hate his guts. We've heard that he is public enemy number one. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? They, they feel sort of betrayed. If you guys say that this Jesus is as bad as you say he is, why are you letting him run around the temple? Are you holding out? Are, are you, is he actually going to do some revolution and you're just, wait, they're confused. But then they come up with their own accusation against him. They say, obviously he can't be the Christ. Verse 27, we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. Two things are in that accusation. Number one is the accusation that, that Micah 5.2, uh, the, the heir of David who will reign on the throne forever, is going to come from Nazareth or Bethlehem? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. It is promised in Scripture that from the, the city of David will come the heir of David. But that doesn't explain this other part. No one will know where he comes from. Well, no, duh, he's going to come from Bethlehem. What they're getting at here, and we see this in our world today, is the idea that, that God only does the big, the super, the miraculous things. Here, here's what it meant in the ancient world for them. It was the idea that uh, we would all be living our lives, and then Elijah would come up, and, and uh, he would just sort of, poof, there he was, and he saw him. And he would say something that would really confuse us. And then there would be a, a, a clap and a peal of thunder in heaven. And then boom, with fire, the Messiah would be there. And he would come up with a sword or a hammer and start smashing Israel's enemies. It was this idea that the Messiah was going to be sort of like a superhero. You know, he comes in with a bolt of lightning, boom. We're not going to know where he comes from. He's going to be supernatural. Now, they're not paying attention to Jesus' works. They're not paying attention to the stories of Matthew and Luke. What they're thinking is Jesus is not a comic book character. His hometown says Nazareth. We know who his brothers are. They told him that he didn't want to come down and be praised before everybody. This guy is not what we were expecting. But Jesus defends his origin. And it's interesting how he does it. We, we would expect him to say, let me, let me quote to you the beginning of Matthew and Luke, or, or let me tell you exactly what my birth certificate says. Instead, he attacks more of that second idea of the Messiah only comes in a boom, bolt of lightning way. In verse 28, he says, you know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. Verse 29, I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. Yes, there's a promise in Micah 5.2, that David's offspring will come from Bethlehem. Yes, there was the idea that isn't really biblical in their day and age that the Messiah will come like a comic book character and blow away our expectations. But in Daniel 7, the Son of Man, does he come from a good rabbi? Does, it, does he come from a good lineage? Does he come from the right town? Daniel 7 cuts through all that and says, the Son of Man comes from the ancient of what? Days. Ancient of days. Jesus is saying, you guys want to talk about origin? You want to know my origin story? I'm from God, and you don't know him. and You haven't seen him, and I can tell you about him. That's where I come from. And now, obviously, the crowd gets a little confused about this. Verse 30, so they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour, same word, that kairos word, had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, 
The one from Daniel 7, the one promised to David, the one promised after Moses. Will he do more signs than this man has done? They're not sure, but they say, this could work out. But notice their belief, is it based off of Jesus' word? Is it based off of who Jesus is? No, it's still based on signs. We'll see that most of this crowd will be there at Jesus' crucifixion, and they will shout, crucify him, crucify him. But here's what I want to make sure you see in this, this overview of the scenes in this passage, is the crowd in general, are more of them coming to believe in Jesus, or are more of them getting one over to arrest Jesus? Arrest. There's some that believe, but it's just because of the signs. If he runs out of signs, I bet they'll be ready to kill him. God's plan is marching forward. Jesus, over and over, is declaring with authority who he is. Let's see what John wants his church to know or do. Let's go to this next slide. Here's, here's what John wants his church to see. I remember, we, we did that big drawing that was all of history. It had the, the creation of the world. It had Jesus coming down from heaven, of God and from God. He does his works and his miracles, his ministry, which, which is, the glory of Christ is in the cross. We'll talk more about that next week. And then he ascends to the right hand of the Father, which is the basis for all worship of him. What John wants his churches to understand is that all of Jesus' life, all of history is on God's kairos. The reason you live today is to point you to what Jesus did. All of history is about him. All of his life, no matter how much they wanted to arrest him, was going to take place the way God intended. He was going to be rejected and rejected and rejected to the point to where even those 12 disciples, even Peter, who would say, you have the words of eternal life, would abandon him because God was doing something big and eternal. Jesus isn't just a failed messiah who goes to jerusalem and gets drug out in the street that could have happened here in john 7 but he is the son of god accomplishing the work of god but then there is the sort of weird verse in verse 6 so jesus kairos is all of his life all of the plans of god he woke up every day and said i have to accomplish all of the plans of god that's why in verse 6 he says, My time has not yet come. I know the schedule. Trains not leave in the station. But then in verse 6 he says this to his brothers, But your time, your kairos, is always here. What's he getting at there? See, here's the truth. And this is true for you today. Your kairos, your opportunity for crisis, is on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and before the job interview and after and before you take the kids to school and after you pick them up. So here's the truth. In your life, there is one crisis that is ever before you. Who is Jesus? The brothers were answering it wrong. They did not believe. But here's the truth, human. You may say, oh, I felt I was at a crisis point whenever I was, I was undergoing surgery. I, I felt like I was at a tipping point whenever it was whether I go back to school or join the military. Whatever crisis point you have, the crisis point of your life is who is Jesus. Jesus' crisis point is big. He's got to do all this God stuff. You have to answer one question. And John wants to give his churches back up in that process see john's churches are, are some of them are still meeting in synagogues they, they know jewish rabbis they, they they know people that are haven't made up their mind about jesus and what we see in this passage because there's so much from the pharisees and from the jerusalem crowds is the synagogues they faced in their day did not have good reason for not believing in jesus in this passage they say ah he, he ain't never studied enough he, he ain't got enough education he says, my teaching's from God. They, they, they would say, and this is the accusation, is you break Sabbath. And Jesus says, I don't care about your traditions. I care about the word of God. That was the refute for the synagogue leaders. And then for, I mean, this is something to think about. Some of the disciples are talking to people. James, the brother of Jesus, they're talking to people who know Jesus. And they're saying he's the son 
of God. And in their mind, and, and we do this too in our mind, be honest. We're like, well, God's going to come through in a big way. And we don't think that that, that means that God is going to give us strength to endure and we're going to be encouraged by Christian brothers and sisters and it's going to take us years and years and our whole lifetime to get us to where God wants to. What we mean whenever we say God will come through in a big way is boom, bolts of lightning. Guess what? Jesus was born in Bethlehem and he's been working forward to this moment for 33 years. It's not always the, the Avengers movie. It's not always the comic book God. It's not just that Jesus is meant to be a, a secret that comes on the scene. He was a man from Nazareth, but he is from God. And then next week, they'll bring up the accusation. Well, he's not from David. He's not connected to that, but we'll touch on that more next week. Let's see the big gospel truth. Oh, this is big. Your judgment and evaluation of Jesus matters. Say amen if that's true. Your judgment and evaluation of Jesus matters. In this passage, Jesus references his signs. What got this all started? John 5, he heals a guy. That brings about a crisis point. He, he's, a, he's a Sabbath breaker or he's true. Jesus has teaching. He's teaching against their traditions. He's either teaching the word of God or he's true. His origin, he is from God or he's a big time liar. And then if you've, if you've been around church, you, you've heard, maybe not this word, Kairos, but this idea that Jesus fulfills all of God's plan. All of this is about him. And he either is lying whenever he speaks like that, or he is true. And in this story, we specifically have the Galilean crowd. They say, there was some muttering about him among the people. Some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading people astray. And we'll see that that is a, a severe accusation. Here's the truth. In our world, there are people that say, I will make up my mind about Jesus later. Jesus would tell him, just like he told his brothers, your time for crisis is always before you. This is an eternal question with an eternal answer and eternal consequences. You don't say, I'll wait until after taxes. You don't say, I'll wait until next week. It is before you now. And there is a right answer. So let's go to this last side. Don't miss this. Unbeliever, do you doubt Jesus for the lack of evidence? I can under, I, I'm, there may be people, probably not too many, you would say today is the first time I heard about Jesus. I'd never heard about that before. That there are people in the world that way. This is the first time I've heard about God. I got more questions. I, I need to study a little more. I need to read a little war, more. I can understand that. But for many people who are unbelievers who say, not today, Jesus, it's because of lack of heart change. You've heard the Christmas story. You've heard the resurrection story. You've heard what Christ can accomplish in the souls and life of men. You have heard that he is coming back to judge the living and the dead. And you've taken all of that and said, I'll decide later. You decide where you're going to eat lunch quicker than you make a decision about Jesus. You don't need more evidence. You don't need more books. You don't need to study more. You need a spiritual work. So if you're an unbeliever that's in that boat, you, you, you've heard the facts and figures, but you don't believe, here's my challenge to you today. Ask questions if you need to. Read if you need to, but try this. This simple prayer. Jesus, if you are real, so I don't believe yet, change my do the spiritual work that you say you can. Be, be the Jesus who you declare you are. Because I think about this Galilean crew. They're still making up their mind. Had they seen just as many signs and miracles as Peter? Yeah, most of them had. Had they heard just as much teaching as Peter? Yeah, they had. But what made Peter able to believe? The work of the Spirit, the work of God in him. We don't always need to study more. Sometimes we need to believe more. It wasn't about the facts. It was about what Jesus did in them. So here's my challenge, unbeliever. Pray this prayer. Jesus, if you are real, change my heart. But believer, a, a lot of us were like, we're, that's fine, pastor. Whew, 
I believe we're okay. Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, died for my sins, buried for three days, but God raised him from the what? Amen. See, y'all are, y'all are still here. But are we complacent in our small unbelief? Are we complacent in our small unbelief? Not straight up blasphemy. Here's what we're talking about. Every, di- every minute of every day, you have the opportunity to live out in belief in who Jesus is or unbelief. Question, why did you give into temptation? Was it because you believed in Jesus and who he was and what he could do for you? Or was it because you didn't? You said, Jesus, you're not enough. There's a moment where you said, Christ is not enough. Why did you mutter against your brother and sister? Was it because you believed in Christ and the work he's done and how much he loves them and you? Or is it because you did not? It is a small unbelief. In all these other ways, we don't believe. I can't pray this. Jesus can't handle that. And, And one that is so tragic for so many believers... God's word can't be true. This is the word about Christ. You bet it's true. We tolerate small unbeliefs. So if there's unbelief in your heart today, you say, I believe Jesus is Lord and Savior, but I've been tolerating this thought. I've been tolerating this this bitterness, this unbelief. You need to repent. Because here's the truth. Here's the truth, and this is old. This is what was in the mind of the Pharisees and the religious teachers as they're listening to all these evaluations about Jesus. This is from Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder he tells you comes to pass, And if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. And then we see in verse 5, here's the consequence for someone who's false, for someone who's not worthy of belief, for someone who lies about who they are and where they are from. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to what? Death. Because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery. Every day, we have the crisis point of declaring something about Jesus. We believe or we don't believe. And so much in our life, we let ourselves get busy and say, I don't have to face that crisis point today. I don't have to think about those eternal things today. Jesus promises it is ever before you. Because with your life, how you live out your belief either declares the cross was the right idea. He's not worthy of belief. He deserves Deuteronomy 13. Or it's the worst thing humanity has ever done. Was he leading people astray? Or was he the good man? So today's message is a call for repentance. We're going to have our time of invitation.